The popular idea of hell as a place of ever-burning torment has frightened countless millions. What really happens to the wicked after death? Are they doomed to hell, where their souls roast in torment forever? If hell exists and the wicked go there, where is it? And what is it? And when do they go? What about the resurrection of the dead? There are many popular beliefs about the fate of unrepentant sinners. Why such confusion? What are the Bible answers? What is the truth about hell? The World to Come The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack Author of 80 Books and Booklets Editor-in-Chief of The Real Truth Magazine Read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world. In a violent age, full of bad news. Answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. Do people's unrepented sins doom them to roast in hell forever? Most professing Christians would answer yes. But is this what the Bible teaches? The most common image of people roasting in hell pictures a God willing to burn people for all eternity without ever totally burning them up. First ask, what kind of God is capable of this? Modern human rights activists recognize the terrible evil of torture even in its temporary forms. Would the loving God of the Bible design an everlasting torture chamber? If so, he would have to witness, for the rest of eternity, the suffering of those that he had condemned to such a hell. We might also ask, how enjoyable could salvation be for the saved if they were forced to watch their children or parents and other loved ones screaming in pain and agony for the rest of time? Do you see the absurdity of this idea? Yet millions upon millions come to this conclusion when they accept the beliefs surrounding the popular concept of hell. Consider what the Encyclopedia Americana says about hell. Hell is generally understood as the abode of evil spirits, the infernal regions whither lost and condemned souls go after death to suffer indescribable torments and eternal punishment. Some have thought of it as the place created by the deity where he punishes with inconceivable severity and through all eternity the souls of those who through unbelief or by the worship of false or different gods had angered him. It is the place of divine revenge, untempered, never-ending." Another quote from the Encyclopedia Americana makes this eye-opening admission about the almost universal acceptance of the common belief about hell. The main features of hell is conceived by Hindu, Persian, Egyptian, Grecian, Hebrew, and Christian theologians are essentially the same. Almost no one understands that it was primarily pagan poets who authored today's widely believed concept about an underground, ever-burning hell. Much of the tradition surrounding the subject of hell came from Dante Alighieri's, he lived from A.D. 1265 to 1321, famous work, Divine Comedy. In it, he described his view of paradise, purgatory, and hell. Notice this from a book about his life titled Dante and His Influence. Quote, of all poets of modern times, Dante Alighieri was perhaps the greatest educator. He possibly had a greater influence on the course of civilization than any other one man since his day, who wrote an incomprehensible verse, an imaginative and lurid account of a dismal journey through a lurid hell. End of quote. This had a tremendous impression and influence on the popular Christian thought and teaching. His Inferno was based on Virgil and Plato. This makes obvious where Dante got his ideas. He believed the pagan philosophers Plato and Virgil were divinely inspired. His fascination with the Greek philosopher Plato 
caused him to accept Plato's ideas about the immortality of the soul, as described in his famous work, Phaedo. Here is what the Encyclopedia Americana says about Virgil, a pagan Roman poet who lived from 70 to 12 BC. Among the Christians of the Middle Ages, including Dante, he was believed to have received some measure of divine inspiration. Few know the true origin of the beliefs that they hold. Fewer still even wish to know, yet we have just laid bare the real origin of this belief. Did you realize that the source of the concept of an ever-burning hell comes from outright paganism? We will see that the popular version of hell has never had anything to do with the true teaching of the Bible. Perhaps the most familiar and often quoted Bible verse is understood by almost no one. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Millions routinely quote this passage while ignoring an essential phrase within it. Reread it. Those who receive salvation are promised that they should not perish perish, but have eternal life. If hell is a place of eternal torture, then the people suffering this torment must also have eternal life. But the verse says, should not perish. It does not say, should not suffer eternal life in torment. How does the word perish relate to the popular teaching about hell and hell fire? Why did God use the word perish if this is not what He meant? If you were employed, you receive regular paychecks. They represent wages paid to you for work done. Now what about God? Does He ever pay wages for work? Notice Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is, here it is, death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This verse exactly mirrors John 3.16. Eternal life is contrasted to death, to perishing. Now get this. The wages of sin is death, not eternal torture in hell. There is no mystery regarding the meaning of wages that an employer pays an employee for his work. Why should there be confusion over the meaning of wages that God pays a sinner for his works? God says He pays the wicked a paycheck of death, not life in torment. Will you let this and other plain statements of God on this subject be as simple as we continue? Before examining a number of additional verses about the subject of hell, important groundwork must be laid. The idea of an ever-burning hell is inseparable from the popular belief that all human beings have immortal souls. What God says about souls is not what you may think. Most people do not understand the relationship between physical men and souls. In Sunday school, I was taught that human beings are born with immortal souls. The common belief is that upon death, the souls of sinners go to hell forever since they are immortal. Is this what the Bible says? Now think. If the wages of sin is death, could the Bible also teach that people have immortal souls? How would that work? Genesis 2 and verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This verse does not say men have souls, but that they are are souls. Adam became a soul. He was not given one. Then, almost immediately, God warned him, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die." When placed together, these verses reveal that men are souls and that souls can die. The prophet Ezekiel was inspired to write, twice in fact, the soul that sins, it shall die. Death is the absence of life. It is the discontinuance, the cessation of life. 
Death is not life in another place. It is not leaving this life for another life, the next life. Further, consider Matthew 10 and verse 28. And fear not them, Jesus said, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, that's God, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The Bible says that souls can be destroyed. We all recognize that bodies eventually die and naturally decompose and are completely destroyed due to the process of natural corruption. Any undertaker recognizes this. This verse introduces the understanding that God does the destroying of souls in hell. Bodies can die and be destroyed in many different ways. However, souls are destroyed in hell by God. Human minds are differentiated from animal brains by intelligent thought. Presumably, if the dead are not dead but are really still alive, then they must be capable of some kind of intelligent thought. They must at least be conscious of their surroundings. Let's consider a series of scriptures. First, notice, put not your trust in the Son of Man. His breath goes forth. He returns to his earth in that very day. Get this, his thoughts perish. When people die, their thoughts end immediately, in that very day. This verse is not compatible with the idea that the dead are consciously suffering in a place of torment. We could suppose that if they are suffering, they do not have knowledge they are. They are unaware of what is happening to them. Ask yourself, what would be the point of their suffering? It would be as though they were in a coma, such as completely unaware of what is going on around them while their sensory nervous system is feeling the tremendous pain sensation of burning. How would this work? Use the following analogy. If someone is to undergo major surgery, they are anesthetized, made to be unconscious, so that they will not experience pain. Medical doctors understand this. Why don't theologians and religionists, why do they deny the plain statements of the Bible? The world to come will continue after this brief message. Discover more from David C. Pack. Visit our website, worldtocome.org. See the World to Come broadcasts. Read and order books, booklets, and articles, all free of charge. To continue learning about the topics covered in this broadcast, visit worldtocome.org today. Now back to David C. Pack. Some who willingly ignore the message of Scripture allege that only mortal thoughts perish, in the sense that the dead leave this earthly realm and experience some mysterious, different kind of thought than they previously knew. Is this true? Of course, this is ridiculous, and the Bible does not say this, but we should at least examine the idea. Now consider this even more direct verse. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. To the honest reader, there is no missing the plain meaning here. If their thoughts perish, of course they would not know anything. That makes sense. Solomon recorded, For that which befalls the sons of men befalls beasts. Even one thing befalls them. As the one dies, so dies the other. Yes, they have all one breath, so that a man has no preeminence above a beast. All go unto one place. Now this is plain. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Psalm 6.5 further explains that the dead do not experience conscious memory. Notice, for in death... There is no remembrance of you, speaking of God, in the grave who shall give you thanks. Could anyone seriously suggest that the dead suffering in hell could experience the normal range of human memories but not be cognizant of God, not remember him? Would God put people in hell and then leave them there suffering, forever wondering how they had gotten there and who had put them there because they had no remembrance of anything related to God? Here is why the dead have no remembrance of God in the grave. Jesus explained this, Marvel not at this, 
For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And the Greek means judgment. Christ told the disciples to marvel not at this because he knew most people would be astonished that everyone who ever lived is now in the grave awaiting the resurrection. My instruction to you is also to not marvel at Jesus' words. Accept them. He said that all, not some, are in the grave. The reason there are no conscious thoughts and no remembrance of God after death is that everyone who has ever died is currently awaiting one of the resurrections to which Christ referred. All people will either be resurrected to eternal life or to judgment. No wonder King David said, As for me, I will behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied, get this, when I awake with your likeness. David understood that the resurrection was an awakening, a coming back to life. The Apostle Paul wrote of a change that will come to all true Christians. Notice, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead shall be raised, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. But the patriarch Job knew this long before. Notice, If a man die, shall he live again? He asks, then answers his own question. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. It certainly is a mystery to the world that there is coming a change to immortality at the resurrection of the dead. How can someone go from mortal to immortal if they already have an immortal soul? Do you see the foolish logic of men when they ignore plain scriptures of the Bible? Now ask yourself, how can people be resurrected if they are already alive as immortal souls? Only the dead, like Christ when he was in the tomb, need to be resurrected. That's the purpose of a resurrection. Do not be fooled by deceivers who say that the resurrection only applies to the body since the soul remained alive after death. You've already seen several scriptures disproving that fallacy. Upon even the most basic examination, the ideas of intelligent men are often exposed as outright foolishness. The popular concept of hell was devised by men as a means of scaring people into following the false religion they had created. The true God would never roast people for all eternity without allowing them to burn up so their suffering could mercifully end. But the devil would, and he's the author of that concept. Many billions have lived and died without ever knowing the name of Jesus Christ and without ever having an opportunity for salvation. Are we to believe they are now roasting in a hell devised by pagan poets? If the unsaved upon death go directly to hell, then well over half the people who have ever lived are there now. Now what is the truth about hell? Since no one has ever returned from the dead, never mind the reports of some who claim they have, never returned from hell and offered a first-hand report, we must either choose to believe the ideas of men or search the scriptures for what God reveals. The Bible does speak about the subject of hell and hellfire in numerous passages. Christ referred to it several times, as did some of the apostles. The prophets also mentioned it several times in the Old Testament. The Bible uses three Greek words in the New Testament and one Hebrew word in the Old explaining the meaning of hell. Let's examine them. The Hebrew word translated hell in the Old Testament is Sheol. It has a New Testament counterpart, Hades. Actually, if you look up Sheol in a concordance, it will reference the Greek word Hades. They both mean the grave, pit, world of the dead, or hell. 
hell is the tomb. In saying this, we have just discovered that all people do, in fact, go to hell at death. Since the Bible does say it is appointed unto all men once to die, then everyone does die and go to hell, literally. All people eventually go to the grave. The word Hades is the most common word used in the New Testament for hell. Actually, some New Testament translations have exchanged the word hell for Hades. I remember learning almost 45 years ago that in the 1600s, people in England spoke commonly of planting or putting their potatoes in hell through the winter. They understood that hell was a dark, cold, quiet place that was a hole in the ground. That's all. This word held no mystery for them. Virtually all sources agree that Sheol and Hades are the same and that both refer simply to the grave. It was only with the passing of time that the pagan view of hell as a blazing underground inferno came to replace this original intent of the word. The second Greek word translated as hell is found only once in the New Testament. Notice 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. The word used here is Tartarus and refers to angels, not people. It means, quote, a prison, incarceration, place of restraint, or a dark abyss. This passage describes the imprisoning of fallen angels on earth as their place of restraint or prison after their rebellion during the pre-Adamic age. We're now prepared to examine the third and final Greek word translated 12 times as hell in the New Testament. Jesus spoke of it when he said, And if your hand offend you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye offend you, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. This verse repeatedly refers to hell and fire unquenched. It also speaks three times of worms that die not. We will return to these terms. In Matthew 5.22, Jesus spoke of those who could be in danger of hell fire. We have already examined another of his warnings to fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell or hell fire. Christ describes destruction in this verse, not ongoing punishing. In each case, the terms hell and hell fire are always translated from the remaining Greek word for hell, Gehenna. It can be translated either as hell or hell fire. Understanding its meaning explains the long quote from Mark 9 just cited. From Hastings Dictionary comes the following definition of this word. Notice, Gehenna occurs 12 times in the New Testament. This term, Gehenna, represents the Valley of Hinnom, Nehemiah 11.30. The place so named was a deep, narrow gorge in the vicinity of Jerusalem. I know, I've been there, I've walked it. Understood to be on the south side. It is repeatedly mentioned in the Old Testament. It became an object of horror to the Jews and is said to have been made a receptacle for bones, the bodies of beasts and criminals, refuse and all unclean things. The terrible associations of the place, the fires said to have been kept burning in it in order to consume the foul and corrupt objects that were thrown into it, made it an unmistakable symbol of dire evil, absolute ruin. So it came to designate the place of future punishment. Some of the bodies that were cast into this valley never made it into the fires burning below. They would get hung up in the brush and trees on the ledges near the rim. In describing the wicked, when Christ stated that their worms die not, he was referring to the bodies of certain criminals that were thrown over the edges of the ravine but did not burn up because they got stuck on a ledge. They literally rotted and decomposed where they were. 
The maggots that entered their bodies completed the decomposition process without interruption from either the fire or anything else. These worms died not, so to speak, because they later developed into flies. This graphic picture is part of the reason that Gehenna was such a place of revulsion to all who were familiar with it. The Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, came to represent a place of final punishment, a place of absolute ruin for all who go there. The reference to hellfire actually refers to the lake of fire described in Revelation chapter 20, verses 13 to 15. Let's read it. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell, that's Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All who enter this lake suffer permanent death. They suffer complete destruction, a final punishment that is everlasting, eternal, permanent. It is not punishing, but is rather punishment that is everlasting. Jesus understood this just as anyone that knew of the fires in the Valley of Hinnom recognized that the bodies of criminals and animals thrown there burned up. A God of mercy and compassion would never torture anything or anyone, let alone do it for all eternity. Now carefully consider these final verses. Psalm 104, verse 35. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. And Malachi 4, 3. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your, that's the righteous feet, in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. Simply take these verses for exactly what they say, adding nothing to them. They are consistent with all that we have seen so far about the fate of the wicked. There is not enough time in a single broadcast to cover all there is about this subject, including supposed proof texts about the fiction of an ever-burning hell, such as the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, among many others. I urge all viewers to read this booklet, The Truth About Hell. It covers in much more detail these supposed proof texts that can all be easily explained. You'll be glad you read it. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646.